we've structured the church, made it so cookie cutter, mm. and then we wonder why aren't people? Um, why do they experience these fire as you opened with? Why do they experience these moments of revival and go back? Yeah, because we've so structured our church services that Holy mm. Spirit no longer has the authority to move in the building anymore. I think the the basis for evangelism is not. Uh, is not even miracles and healings. Mm. It's a call to repentance. And if, yeah. if healing brings people, that's the reason that Jesus heals. It's not so you'll, you'll be immortal, you'll still mm-hmm. die. Yeah. And I tell people that we've seen a lot of miracles and I pray for miracles and I believe in them. It's, that's not the core, mm. that's not the foundation of our ministry is physical healing, it's spiritual mm. regeneration. Hey there, I'm Matthew Foley and this is ISO Insights, where God's truth grows in the midst of current culture. Renewing the mind and spirit. Welcome back to ISO Insights, our podcast here at International School of the Word. I want to ask you a question. Do you know what revival means for a Christian? Maybe you feel a call to evangelism, and maybe you've been a part of major moves of God in your church. You've seen the Spirit of God move on people, their lives be transformed. You've seen people get saved. You've seen saved people get revived. But you've also seen, like a fireworks show, this big dramatic appeal, and then a few months later, people return back to the normal. Perhaps you're wondering to yourself, what does it take for the church to actually sustain revival? Well, ISO has some courses that could help you out with that. At International School of the Word, isow.org, you can see missions and evangelism and also equipping the church for revival. But to talk about that today in more detail, I have evangelist Nick Walker from West Virginia on yes, ISO sir. Insights, and we're glad to have him. Uh, he has ministered to thousands of middle school and high school students in West Virginia. His ministry uh, began w- with his work through the FCA, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, at Wyoming East High School. And he grew up in a holiness Pentecostal background and now travels and preaches as an evangelist. And his goal is to see the power of God touch the lives of young people and bring the church back to where it needs to be. On his ministry website, he says that his ministry is to wait Wake up the church, save the lost, and to empower a generation. It all started in 2013, uh, his calling back to the Lord and into ministry. And by 2015, June, he saw nearly 500 middle school and high school students saved. And that's continued to grow since then with now over 3,000 students experiencing the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. He is the author Mm -hmm. of Walking Tall in Babylon, Revelations from a Caveman, and a new book that I've had the pleasure to read called Culture Shock, Pioneering Revival in a Superficial Church, which we'll talk about today. Nick, I'm glad to have you on ISO Insights. Yeah, I really enjoyed reading your book. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. I'm, yeah. I'm glad that, glad I was able to let you run through it and do some... He gave some edits on the book, so I'm, I'm grateful yeah. for that. Yeah, it was a great experience. I, I really enjoyed reading the book. Um, mm-hmm. I hadn't had the chance to read uh, your other two books, but jumping into this one, I was really impressed by... Uh, the burden that you had for the church in this country. And I do want to know a little bit about your background and who you are. Um, From what I've read in the book and heard from your sermons and your ministry, you grew up in West Virginia. Did you grow up in a particular denomination, or was it just like an old-school holiness Pentecostal? This is an international PHC, so Pentecostal Holiness. Our headquarters is in, uh, I believe it's in Dublin, Virginia. Mm. And so that that was my roots. As far back as I can remember was a little Pentecostal Holiness church in Mullins. We had um, probably 1,200 people in our in our town, a very wow. small coal mining town. Mm-hmm. And my my mother and my father and, and all my, you know, my grandparents would tell me that Mullins used to be this really lively, large, booming town. Yeah. In fact, there used to be two movie theaters in, in Mullins, I'm right. told. Um, or maybe it was either two bowling alleys or two movie theaters. It was mm-hmm. a very, very large town booming with the coal mining. But of course, in the last couple decades and especially in the last 15 years coal mining's really taken a hit under mm-hmm. some administrations and so um Mullins is now just a you would almost it almost appears as a ghost town a shell of what it used to be wow. but there's some really wonderful people there and I actually youth pastored in that church that I grew up in mm-hmm. um don't want to take too much time on the background here but I grew up in church my whole life mm-hmm. um I didn't have a real encounter with Jesus though until I was 16 um, luckily I was raised up in a, in a great Christian home. We were in church every Sunday. Um, but I had a real encounter with Jesus at 16. I, I got addicted to pornography at 11, mm-hmm. uh, had an encounter with Jesus at 16, but there was not a lot of, not a lot of preaching on pornography. There, there was on wow. fornications and, and, you know, yeah. a, sexual acts with, with people, 
but pornography was not often talked about, so I didn't realize I was in sin. Why do you think that is in that church background? I just think it's uncomfortable, not just for the church I grew up in, but for churches at large. It's just, a, for whatever reason, a very uncomfortable mm. topic to talk about yeah. sexual sexual things at large. Mm. And I think, uh, unfortunately, that's caused a lot of young people to fall snare or fall prey to the snare of the enemy with with sexual temptations and addictions. They just don't. They they think they they understand that fornication is is not is not mm. biblically correct, um, but they don't understand the other promiscuous because it's, it's just yeah. not talked about. Yeah. But um, the the Lord delivered me of that shortly after I was saved. It wasn't when I got saved because I didn't know I was. I didn't know I was in sin. Mm. When I found out this is a problem, then the Holy Spirit delivered me. And, and so uh, growing up in Mullins was, uh, it, I loved it. It was a small, small town. You knew everybody. Um, it, was, it was very mm. safe. You could go through the neighborhoods and, and play, with, play with all the kids, you know, and it was, it was, a, it was a nice place to grow up, really. People, people might not think that because it's a, it is a small, um, economically very poor area. Mm-hmm. Our whole region's one of the poorest in the country, one of the most addicted in the country. But there's there's very sweet, well mm-hmm. well meaning, genuine people there. And fortunately, I was able to have a, a great, a wonderful core church family in that mm-hmm. little Pentecostal holiness church. Yeah. So, what did faith look like in the Mullins community, and what did faith and devotion to Jesus look like in your family, in the culture you guys had at home? My dad told me that my first words as a child were was Hagee, because really? he played jo- he John Hagee was on <laughs> John Hagee was That's on cool. every Sunday, yeah. And he said your first words were you walked in the living room, pointed at the TV, and went Hagee. <laughs> so our, my my earliest childhood preaching memories were John Hagee, Jensen Franklin, and Perry Stone. Wow, those are my That's awesome. mainly John Hagee, um, and of course you know we had our had our Sunday and Wednesday night services mm. Sunday morning of course too, but. Um, and so I was, I was raised up with these, with, you know, Christian values. Dad would pray for us every morning before school. That's awesome. And so it was a, um, that, that was kind of the, the foundation of my faith, but I did, I still yet didn't have a a real encounter with Jesus Mm -hmm. until I was 16. And what was that like, that encounter? I know it was at, um, I think it was a winter fest for the church. Smoky Mountain Winter Fest. It's actually a church of God event. Yeah, so it's not even a, P- a Pentecostal, mm-hmm. but it's a it's a Church of God event, um, not sponsored by the PHC. I mean, mm-hmm. it is a Pentecostal event. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a pa- powerful, and that was actually um, that was the first time I had seen miracles, signs, and mm. wonders. Really, the first mm-hmm. miracles you ever I'd seen? seen? Yeah, I'd seen speaking in tongues, of course, okay. in my Pentecostal church. I'd never seen the miraculous. Mm. Um, the the speaker the night I got saved was Kevin Wallace. Mm-hmm. Right here in oh, Chattanooga, yeah. and he gave a word of knowledge. That was my first. Uh, that was my first encounter with a word of knowledge. He gave a word of knowledge to while he was preaching that someone was in the room who was ready to commit suicide. He came running down from the nosebleeds with a wow. gun in his hand. He was going to do it in the in the building. Really, as I recall. it was crazy. As, as I recall, he comes down with the gun in hand, throws, throws it on the stage, and gives his heart to the Lord. Uh, Kevin poured a whole gallon of oil on him. Whoa, uh, upon, it was amazing. And I and I was like, "What is going on here?" I'd never yeah, seen yeah. that kind of power. Yeah. And wow. so that was my first. Um, and I was kind. Of, I wasn't in the nosebleeds. I was kind of in the middle section where you would sit to watch a basketball game. And I, 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 what, I feel like I blinked and I was on the floor in the altar. I don't remember the trip from the seat to the to the altar. Mm -hmm. I have no recollection of it. I remember standing in my seat with tears. I remember waking up on the floor Mm -hmm. and my hair was long back then. It's like Drake Bell (laughs) and it was curly. And so my hair was everywhere. One of the deacons at my church, his name's David Booth. He said, I come back up after the service was over and he, my hair is everywhere. And he was like, what happened to you? And I said, I don't know. (laughs) I have no idea. And, and I, um, I actually started preaching Seven months later. Wow, that's amazing. Very man. quickly. Whoa. Which is where FCA. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was always I was always a part of FCA in middle school and high school. Were they calling it out of you? Were they like, oh, you've got the calling man? Or did you just start no, doing it? No, I, I, it was. You know, Perry has his experience in an mm-hmm. all night prayer meeting, getting called to preach. Mm-hmm. You hear these great stories of people getting called to preach, and and mine wasn't in an all night prayer meeting or a fast or a voice out of heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, after I got saved, I could not quit talking about. Him. Oh wow, that's awesome! Wow. And um, 
my theology wasn't necessarily there yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I I didn't understand the importance of reading scripture for yourself. I thought mm-hmm. it was fine to just listen to the preacher on Sunday. Mm-hmm. We can get to that in a minute with the waking up of the church, but I I thought that was fine. Yeah. And um, and and so I remember after I got saved in my classrooms, I just tell people this is what happened to me. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I I cussed like a sailor. I was in church every Sunday, and the church people loved me. I, I knew how to play the part. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of church people know how to play the part. I knew how to play the church part. I knew how to put on the Sunday best, as they call it, and come in and raise your hands while everyone else is raising their hands. And I knew how to fit in with the church. And then Monday to Saturday, I was a totally different person, watching pornography, treating women as objects and toys mm-hmm. and not and and not the daughters of God that they are and and cussing at everybody. Um, at being mm-hmm. angry with I was, yeah. I was just a- yeah. angry, some you know, and so uh, I, I knew, how to, but I knew how to play the two different parts and live in the two different worlds. And then I encountered Jesus, mm-hmm. and so I couldn't stop talking about it. And so seven months later, I I actually went and asked the our teacher who sponsored FCA, could I speak? I have something that I just feel like I need to share. The message was nine minutes long. <laughs> Wow. Um, <laughs> some people still wish I was nine minutes long because yeah. I'm much more long-winded now. Hey. But um, it was nine minutes long. I actually played a Casting Crown song midway through and preached on the lyrics of the song. Really? <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's it was called uh, it's called Here I Go Again, and uh-huh. it was about yeah 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 it was about us neglecting to share the gospel mm. actually, and so that that's how that's how it began mm-hmm. and my my first several messages dad had to help me cuz i i had i didn't have a lot of scriptural mm-hmm. head knowledge and so you had to find your references and get your scriptures sure. for uh, your dad preaching i want to preach on this well here's some scripture for yeah, that you know yeah, he, yeah. he would help me he helped me with my first i have a i have a file of messages that dad helped me with and that's they're cool. in their own separate file i kept them all and there's like 10 or 12 that dad helped me with and so uh, after i did the fca the first time uh uh, I was actually so nervous. Mm-hmm. I read the scripture with my back facing the, the kids. Really? <laughs> yes. Wow, man. My, my the sponsoring teacher told caught, uh, told me it was cute. She said <laughs> oh, she no. said, "Well, that was cute." That's not what you want to hear. And man. I was like, no. hmm. <laughs> she, she said, "That was cute." Next time you preach, you might want to face the people. And I was like, oh. and so my mother said, "Are you sure you're called to do this?" Oh. <laughs> and I said, I, "You know, I don't know." <laughs> and I guess it just got more and more comfortable. I never yeah. I never took a course or a class on how to develop a sermon. Mm-hmm. Um I think it was just something that Holy Spirit downloaded yeah. into me. Mm-hmm. But I I don't remember having this moment of like, this is the night the Lord called me. Mm-hmm. But I've always had desire. Yeah. But that's where it begins. It yeah. be, even when you know, like like Perry had his all night prayer meeting, but before the all night prayer meeting, he had desire. Mm. And for us, I think it, it for everyone, it needs to begin with a desire to absolutely tell everybody this is it, gospel in its simplest form. Mm-hmm. Is this is what this is what Jesus did for me, mm-hmm. and so that's where it yeah. began. And I I don't think preaching is about uh, some structure. I think it's good mm-hmm. to learn how to organize your thoughts sure. and how to bring them together, and then how to communicate them. But I've always when I've looked at people being trained to preach. First of all, I think sitting under a preacher is probably the best way you yes, can really is. learn how to preach. Mm-hmm. And that's true with all the gifts of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. Um, and the second thing is, I think that when it comes to preaching, uh, you really, being led by the Spirit is the most important thing. Because you can put together the prettiest message in the world, but unless it's the Spirit of God's put it in you yes. to share, how's it going to have power? And I could tell the difference, right? Like, I, I developed my message, and yeah. Dad would help me put the points together. And I could tell... If if I was just reading my notes like a political speech, yeah, or yeah. if Holy Spirit was inspiring it, and I could always tell in the altar service, yeah, if Holy there Spirit, if Holy Spirit was be was the guide and not Nick, mm-hmm. altar services were packed. Wow. And if if I was just reading my speech, people would say, "Well, that was a good message," but there would be no response where wow. people were actually being changed by a gospel of power. Wow. And so I had to learn how to. And, and I'm always still mm-hmm. learning how to do that. Now that I'm long-winded and more than nine minutes, um, <laughs> one of the hardest things for me to do is, is uh, and I'm always, you know, Holy Spirit, tell me when to stop. Because mm-hmm. I've got pages and pages of notes. I've studied a lot, many hours now. When you sit under Perry mm-hmm. and Dr. B, you have to. Yeah. It's just yeah. something that happens. And so uh, there's a lot of head knowledge. 
I have to have Holy Spirit tell me when to quit because you can preach past people's conviction mm -hmm. and then nothing wow. happens. Preach past people's conviction. Was it? Could you explain that a little bit? And so, like when I'm when I'm in a revival atmosphere, I'm ministering and the Spirit of the Lord's mm. falling. I I can the Holy Spirit shows me while I'm ministering when people are under conviction and you can see it on their face, mm. you know, and you and you can see maybe if someone's under conviction and it's uncomfortable, that's when they pull their phone out. That's suddenly when they have to go pee. Ah, you know? really? So they, that's when the that's, bathroom break comes. That's when the ba when yeah. there's when there's heavy <laughs> conviction. And so, um, if when you when you see that you're at peak, I, mm -hmm. I call it peak conviction. Mm -hmm. When they're when you're at the moment where like people, if you gave a call right now, mm. they would respond to it. If you go long, if you go further past that, which I've I've made the mistake of doing and had to repent, it wow. becomes more about your sermon Message. than the Holy Spirit's assignment that night. Mm -hmm. If you get into that realm, you, you then you cross from the spirit into the flesh. Wow. You're more worried about getting your point across than you are getting the Holy Spirit to people. And so what happens is when you reach that peak conviction, if you go past it, then people will begin to talk themselves out of the conviction. Wow. Have you ever like had to cut your, your sermon short, real, real short, mm -hmm. for the Holy Spirit moving on people? Last year I was in a revival that had gotten extended for two weeks. I think we were on night nine or ten. Um and I was ministering, and I had, I probably had an hour worth of notes, and 12 minutes in, mm -hmm. peak conviction hit. Wow. And I had to make a decision, because the in, in my brain, I was like, oh, this is so good. This message is so good. Mm -hmm. I was so excited to preach it, <laughs> you know. I was so excited to jump into it. Yeah. And then peak conviction hit. And the, uh, what what began was the Lord gave me a word of knowledge for a young person in the room that needed deliverance. So I stopped stopped preaching, gave the call for a word of knowledge. The young lady responded to it. It's one of those reading your mail type mm -hmm. moments. Yeah. She gets delivered. And then it was like people saw that because the scripture is clear that the gifts edify the church and they help the unbelievers. And so there's unbelievers in the room that see that and they're like, whoa. Wow. God's real. He couldn't have known mm -hmm. that about her. If you keep on preaching, they will talk themselves out of what out they of just witnessed. Wow. But if you stop right there and give an altar call, like they're under conviction, let them respond. Mm -hmm. And so I gave an altar I gave the altar call after the word of knowledge and we had like 40 baptisms that night. My word. So you had yeah. to discern in that moment mm -hmm. what the spirit of God was doing. It's a it's a difficult thing sometimes, especially when you have all these notes and you feel good about mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not that the Lord didn't give you the notes, because the Lord very much gave me the notes. In fact, I, I preached the same message the next night and finished it. Wow. And the same result. Wow. It's about obedience, though. Because, mm. you know, I keep all my notes, and I go preach them again in other places, but it's, it's all about obedience. And I think we've missed that in the church, and that's why we have... I don't want to get ahead of the, of the agen agen agenda here, but, you, you know, it's, it's obedience. It's not yeah. program. It's not... It's not this, 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 this. We have we've structured the church, made it so cookie cutter, mm. and then we wonder why aren't people? Um, why do they experience these fire as you opened with? Why do they experience these moments of revival and go back? Yeah, because we've so structured our church services that Holy mm. Spirit no longer has the authority to move in the building anymore. Mm. It's almost like we've structured it to the point where it's like you can move between this part of the agenda, but you have to give the rest of it to us. Hmm. That's never it's never been the intention. You read in, in wow. Acts, I think it was when Peter was preaching at uh, uh, was it Cornelius' yeah. house and the yeah, Holy Spirit fell while he was preaching. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, that, those are and that's that's what you're discerning while you're preaching. Holy Spirit, Holy, he can fall whenever he wants mm -hmm. to. We have to have an eye for it to see when when is he going to fall, mm -hmm. and when he does, we have to get out of the way every time. Wow. At ISO, we always strive to provide discounts and incentives for our students. Now, we're thrilled to announce our best value ever, the ISO All Access Pass. For just $99 per month, any student can access our entire learning platform. An ever-expanding library of fascinating, groundbreaking teaching at your fingertips for the average price of just one ISO course. There has never been such a prime opportunity to pursue your biblical education. Students in many traditional schools pay $100 to learn every day for every single course. With the All Access Pass, that amount gives you access to our entire course catalog. At ISO, you can learn from world-class teachers on a wide variety of subjects, all at your own pace. With the subscription-based model of the All Access Pass, there are no obligations to put yourself in debt for decades. 
If you're hungry to learn about the Word, there's never been a better value. That's countless hours of teaching and materials with no limit on how much you can learn. Now, more than ever, ISO is excited to connect the Word with the world. Go to isow.org to get started with the All Access Pass today. I've never heard anybody explain preaching, the practical viewpoint of preaching, because a lot of young people are trying, they feel the calling of God, and they're trying to find a way to actually put together notes and to preach, but to say to them, well, God, God did speak to you in the, the secret place, all these things that you're putting down, mm -hmm. but it's a different thing to be preaching and to discern what the Holy Spirit's doing in that moment, and you could pick up and preach the rest of it later. That was mm -hmm. a cool insight. Because mm -hmm. how many people actually say that when it comes to telling people how to preach or trying to train them into preaching? Like, we, we train them how to give them the three points yeah. and the scripture reference and some Greek Hebrew words. Mm -hmm. Here's your lexicon and all yeah, this. Yeah. But we, don't, we do not teach them, or at least many people don't teach them. You can't say that for, it'd be unfair to, mar to you know, do that for everybody. But mm -hmm. there's not a lot of teaching on, there's a lot of teaching on sermon development. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of teaching on how do you discern when the spirit of the Lord is ready to, ready to pour out on a congregation. And when he is, you have to quit. That's mm -hmm. why, you know, those, um, I, you grew up Pentecostal. Yeah, right? totally. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, so you, you remember those services, I'm sure were Holy Spirit filled during worship and the pastor didn't get to preach. Yeah, totally. Those are the best services. <laughs> the, we <laughs> call, we call them yeah. the best services and it's, it's not because the pastor didn't get to preach. Yeah. And that, that's happened at, at, at every single one of my revivals, at mm -hmm. least one night. That happened, and it's mm -hmm. not you don't you don't schedule it in like we're gonna have a worship night tonight. Mm. It's just when the Holy Spirit falls, and He can fall throughout the service, and He falls He falls through preaching. Mm. It's just about discerning what He wants to do in the moment. And if He's if you're if you're on point two, and there's six points, and He and He falls, and there's mm. conviction. Just like like one night, I was I was at a rev I could do revival stories. We could do a yeah, whole podcast yeah. on stories. I'm sure I'm preaching at service, and three so three days before it was a Sunday. I'm in my hotel room praying, and I hear the Holy Spirit say to me, Abigail needs healed. And I was yeah. like, I don't know an Abigail. Mm. This is in the book, I think, in yeah, the Culture is, Shock. I said, I don't know an Abigail. I'm just, I'm just creating things in my mind, I said. So I put mm -hmm. it out of my mind. That was on a Sunday afternoon. So I preach the service on Sunday night, Monday night. Mm -hmm. We get to Tuesday night. I'm, I'm uh, transitioning between the worship and the preaching. Take the microphone. Good to see everybody. I'm taking up the offering. While I'm taking up the offering, Holy Spirit says to me, Abigail needs healed now. Well, on Sunday, he just said, Abigail needs healed. Mm -hmm. I put it out of my mind, though, because I thought it was my flesh. But yeah. then he said, Abigail needs healed no. now. Hmm. Not tomorrow. Has to be right now. Mm -hmm. ha has to be. Oh, sorry. And I said, okay, I don't want to give this altar call because what if Abigail's not in the room? Yeah, and yeah. Then there comes this moment of, do I have faith to believe that this is what the Lord mm -hmm. has said? <laughs> so, so I said, I said, everybody close your eyes. Yeah. That way, if yeah. there's not an Abigail, I'll be the only one. <laughs> I'll be the only one that yeah. knows. Yeah. And I was, wow. and I'm sitting there in my mind, and I'm like, there better be an Abigail, or I'm gonna have to, <laughs> I'm gonna have to go on another sabbatical yeah. and just stop. <laughs> so I'm I gonna said, have to take a break until I everybody to take forgets a break about it and hear the Lord. Yeah, you know, pray and fast and submit the flesh. And so I said, Holy Spirit. And so I, I got in the mic and I said, Holy Spirit is telling me that Abigail needs healed. Mm -hmm. Said she raised your hand. Well, a woman raised her hand, starts weeping in the back, and I'm like, Great, that's Abigail. So one of my prayer team members goes back and ministers to her, and <laughs> when I gave the altar call. Um, it was right after that word mm. because when my prayer team member goes back to Abigail, I didn't know, but there's an, ag there's an agnostic on the front row Wow! from a high school. He sees that word and knows that I don't know an Abigail. And, and I look, I look down at him and I didn't know him either. Mm -hmm. And he's just looking at me. <laughs> Big old eyes. I mean, he's yeah. like saucers. And he was like, whoa. And the Holy Spirit said to me, he's an unbeliever. He's ready now. Wow. And so I gave another call, and I said, mm -hmm. and I thought, I, I didn't know that he was an agnostic. I just said, Holy Spirit's telling me that there's, and I didn't call him out. I just said, Holy Spirit's telling me there's an unbeliever in the room. I knew it was him, but I wasn't going to point him out that way. Mm -hmm. you create like an embarrassment yeah. thing for him. So I just said, there's an unbeliever in the room that's ready to, to repent, and uh, you've mocked the Lord, and now it's time to come home. And he, he came to the altar, <sighs> had a vision of Jesus Whoa. With, no, with no Bible knowledge, and he comes to me and describes Jesus to me. Um, 
with with the robe that mm. he wore when he washed the disciples' feet, not a kingly robe. He said mm-hmm. he had on a, na- a dirty kind of garment, mm-hmm. and he had a king's robe on over it and took wow. it off. And I was like, he, he gave all this stuff to me that I don't have time to go into, and I was like, mm. whoa. He has no knowledge of Jesus. And yeah. so when that happened, I gave the altar call. I didn't preach that night. And, wow. and that's, you know, you just have to discern when Holy Spirit wants to touch a mass of people mm-hmm. during worship, yeah. d- during the middle of your message. So what would you say is like the calling of an evangelist in your experience, biblically speaking, and, and from what we define evangelist to be in the church in America? Is there a difference? Well, we know, we know evangelism, of course, is a simple word that means to, to speak good news. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's just the, I think it's the Greek word for evangelist, just someone who mm-hmm. preaches good news. But, and I'm not, I'm not going to deviate from what yeah. Scripture plainly says, but I will say that I can't, and we know that uh, Philip is the first known evangelist Mm -hmm. in acts Mm -hmm. um but i can't find a biblical evangelist that did that that didn't give a call to repentance and so Mm -hmm. i think i think the the basis for evangelism is not uh is not even miracles and healings Mm -hmm. it's a call to repentance and if if healing brings people that's the reason that jesus heals it's not so you'll you'll be immortal you'll still Mm -hmm. die yeah and i tell people that we've seen a lot of miracles and I pray for miracles and I believe in them. It's, that's not the core, mm. that's not the foundation of our ministry is physical healing. It's spiritual mm. regeneration. And yeah. so there has to be a call to repentance. Mm-hmm. Another thing that I think is key to evangelism that I think is missing is a call to the water, to bury your old mm-hmm. life in water baptism, yeah. watery grave. And we have delegated baptism to a photo op and we have mm-hmm. our, ba- our special baptism services that's not the way it was in the New Testament at all. At, in the early not church, one not time. And, yeah. uh, and, and I'm not saying having a special baptism service is wrong by any mm-hmm. means, but I am saying that um, if, if, I'm, if I'm preaching a call to repentance, mm-hmm. there, I think there needs to be water around. Yeah. You look in Acts, I can't find one time that, a, that, a, that the preaching of the gospel happened and water wasn't nearby. Yeah, that's why. I, that's why I do absolutely. my horse trough, Mm -hmm. I bring the water with me because there has to be, if you're going to give a call to repentance, I think it's also appropriate to Mm -hmm. give them an opportunity to bury their sin so it doesn't go home with them. And that could be why we have so many, and there there could be many reasons for that. I think one of them is that we give, you know, you have these fiery revival experiences. Mm -hmm. Why are they going back to normal? Mm -hmm. Maybe we're not given an opportunity for them to bury their sin because there's, it's not just a photo op. Yeah. And it's not just a symbolic thing. There's mm-hmm. power in baptism. I know that like there's a Swedish guy, and he has a channel called New Reformation, and he ended mm-hmm. up in prison recently. Um, I think his name is Torben Sundergaard. But mm-hmm. he uh, basically, I think they have a very strong theology about baptism being required for salvation. They lean uh-huh. towards that. But what's interesting is he said... He said the reason so many churches are lukewarm in evangelicalism is exactly because of that. He said there are things wow. that Jesus commanded very specifically. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he said if people who are, have demonic spirits are set free when you approach baptism with faith, mm-hmm. people who have had sins that have bound them for years yes. are freed from them if you approach baptism in faith. So every time they're getting someone saved, they immediately go to baptize them. And that's like the moment of sanctification, he said, in their nature. is like when they see God set them apart to holiness. Mm-hmm. And it shocked me that in the Pentecostal church, which is so focused on holiness and on obeying God and taking the Bible literally, baptism has gone neglected. It has absolutely has, um, you, like okay. You, you give an altar call. I, I find that lots of people are ready to regurgitate your prayer and mm-hmm. repeat a prayer after me. Yeah. Yeah. But then if you go to have them baptized that night, they're not ready. Mm. And they're why is it that we're ready to be saved, but we're not ready to bury our old life? Wow. If you're not ready to bury your old life, you're not ready to be saved. That's right. But but we have right. in America we have said salvation is the repetition mm-hmm. of a prayer, and mm-hmm. so that is why we have grown so lukewarm. I think baptism needs to be a key element of our services, mm. and not every service. There are you know the, the Lord has different assignments other than call to repentance. There mm. there are commissioning services. There's ser- there are services yeah. for healing. There are services where you're anointing people to go forth into the harvest field, maybe and maybe leadership summits mm-hmm. and things like that. Maybe you don't need the baptism tank for, but if you're giving a call to repentance and you're just preaching a gospel of power, there, there must be water around wow. somewhere. And we've seen um, over, over 4,500 baptisms since July of 2020. <laughs> That's amazing. With our, with our amazing, tank. Yeah. And 
I mean, there there are pastors getting in there, and there are wow. worship leaders getting in there, and deacons getting in there. There's people being healed of terminal illnesses yeah. in there. I mean, it's it's remarkable what we're seeing when there's faith in the water, and mm-hmm. it's not just a symbolic act. Mm-hmm. When they're when they're actually believing that I'm burying infirmity in the water, I'm gonna be they different. come up healed, man. Like people, <laughs> Praise God. people we've had to lower in the tank that were in a wheelchair, walk yeah. out and push their chair. It, amazing stuff. Yeah. And of course the Lord can do it without the water. Mm-hmm. Um, we can't, we, we, we can't be so religious about the water, Yeah, yeah. you know? And so that's, that's kind of where God. flexibility comes in yeah. where we say God can only move this way, mm-hmm. you know? And so that, wow. I, th- I think a key to evangelism in these last days though, there has to be baptism water ready mm-hmm. to go at all times. Wow. What do you think is the biggest thing for the American church right now? Can we be awakened? And it's a big question. Absolutely. Um, that, that's our, you, you said it, our three missions for this ministry, wake up the church, mm-hmm. save the lost, empower a generation. And mm-hmm. I, I believe they have to happen in that order. I, I didn't just put them that way to yeah. sound poetic. I think they yeah. have to happen in that order because if you, if you empower a generation, you see a bunch of young people get saved mm-hmm. and the church is not asleep, mm-hmm. all that's going to happen is they're going to get empowered for a moment yeah, they they will be like the seed in thorny ground, hmm. because if the church isn't awake, they won't have anything to go to but their thorns. And wow. when they grow, they'll get choked out. You have to have a That's church amazing. ready to pull them out of that dirt. <sighs> and so, because if, if you if you see a bunch of young people saved mm-hmm. and the church is asleep, they're just going to go and go to sleep with the church. Wow. And, and so yet the church must be awakened first. Mm-hmm. And that's that's revival revived because to be revived, you have to have first lived. And so revival can't happen to someone who's never experienced Jesus. Revival yeah. can only happen to people who have and they're and they're asleep. Wow. Then you have awakening, which is the um I, I don't want to I don't want to use the word epiphany, but when mm-hmm. you have a when you when you come awaken to something for the first time. Mm-hmm. For the first time. Mm-hmm. These are these are people who've never experienced Jesus. See, revival must happen in the church, mm-hmm. then you save the awakening. lost. Yeah. And then a generation is empowered by that. Mm. So I think they have to happen in that order. The biggest thing for the church right now is a very big question. Um, and I don't, I don't want to be, I mean, it's not, it's not a profound thing. We need genuine, true repentance. Not a, uh, well, I'll repent, then use grace as a license to sin, mm. come back and repent next week. We need, true, we need true repentance in Greek that means to change the way we think about sin. Because hmm. repentance doesn't just mean I'm sorry. Repentance means I am cha- the Lord is changing the way that I think when I see sin. Hmm. Uh, John Bevere, I'm not, I'm not credited. I'm not taking credit for this one. John Bevere mm-hmm. just wrote a book called The Awe of God. Yeah, and he and I've I haven't read it, but I've seen his interviews about it. And what he is saying is the probably the biggest thing for the church right now is that pe- people do love Jesus, but they mm-hmm. don't hate sin. Wow. And it's possible to have a love for God and not a fear of God. Mm -hmm. And I think we've lost the fear of the Lord. But don't you, if you've got a love for God, but not a fear of the Lord or a hatred of sin, don't you misunderstand who God is? Yes. Like, do you know God, in fact, if you don't have a correct perspective? I don't think you fully know him. Mm. It's like going out on dates with someone and you don't really know him intimately. You don't live Ah, with him. That's good. You know, like like you, you know him, um, you know him at church, Mm -hmm. you know him. At dinner, yeah, you know them at ball games, mm-hmm. but you don't, you don't, go, you haven't, but you haven't yet gone to their home and see how they live, and you mm-hmm. haven't, you haven't spent intimate time with them, and yeah. so that I think people, I think people love uh, a lot of people love what God can do for them. Mm. It, you know they, yeah, they love what God, they love the blessings yeah. of the Lord, but fire doesn't feel good. Pentecostals wow. love to preach fire, fire of God, the fire, and I preach on the fire of God, but the fire of God is, I mean, do you enjoy getting burned? I don't mm, think so. No, like no. physically burned by fire, because that's what <laughs> yeah. happens in the spirit. Yeah. Because he says, "I wish you'd buy from me gold that's been refined by fire." Mm-hmm. And so, you know, of course, you you put the gold in the melting pot, and all the impurities come to the surface. Is the mm. is the implication there? God puts us in the fire, and our and our junk comes to the surface. Wow. I wow. find that when you're when when God has put you in the fire, you might start seeing things, um, impurities, might start to become more prevalent. Wow. Yeah. Maybe you'll yeah. have these anger outbursts that were suppressed for years, and you're mm-hmm. like, what's going on? Well, the Lord's bringing things to the surface you need to repent of. Wow. And Man, that's, that's, that's what I think the church needs is fire that brings impurities to the surface. 
You know, I, I kind of want to segue. I, we, wanted, we wanted to talk about uh, mm-hmm. your book. I could even, we'll, we'll invite you back on to do that we in must more do detail. That. It has to happen again. <laughs> it has to happen again. But uh, with a lot of, uh, because you talked about in your book, spiritual flexibility, you talked in your book about a need for discipleship. And there's a connection that I've seen in my own walk with the Lord where I grew up in Pentecostal church. I grew up in spirit-filled mm-hmm. church. I encounter the Lord really strong. Um, already had the baptism of the Holy Spirit, already saw signs, you know, the gifts of the Spirit moving at the age of 10. But at the age of 12, had a very strong encounter with the Lord. And during that time, it was almost like an unveiling, like seeing the Lord more accurately than I'd ever Mm -hmm. seen him before. But you talk about the fire of God being uncomfortable. And I think that this is something that a lot of people get freaked out about the Spirit-filled church service. Because when you sense God's presence, it's not always comforting. Uh, when God is trying to change you and cause you to walk to a deeper level. That's something that was surprising. And the the wild thing is when the Lord has, re- t- times where I've experienced the Lord revealing himself before, there was this first layer where the holiness of God has this fear and awe to it, like you mentioned mm-hmm. John Bevere's writing about. But once you consecrate yourself and you ask the Lord to cleanse you and you obey him or you make, like you fix whatever he's telling you to fix and you go back and repent where he's told you to repent, there's this place that you enter beyond it that's yeah. like the greatest joy you can ever have in Absolutely. your life. Absolutely, because you know you're in right standing with yeah. him. Yeah, the, fear, the fear of God is not the phobia of God, it's mm-hmm. the reverence of God. There you go. And so there, there's a, and those are two different kinds of fear. You have a deep mm-hmm. reverence and respect for people, mm-hmm. you know, maybe a like a celebrity or mm-hmm. someone like that. You know, you have yeah. a, a reverence for them and a respect, and yeah. you're intimidated to speak with them. <laughs> and 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 so that's like a that's the kind of fear we should have for the Lord as a. Mm-hmm. And that's probably a poor comparison, maybe more reverence than a celebrity. Yeah. <laughs> but it, the the point remains that there's, a, there's a deep a are. deep respect and reverence yeah. for His Word. Like John was talking mm-hmm. about, there's there's power in trembling at His Word when wow. you read it. Because wow. these are words spoken from heaven. Mm-hmm. These aren't just book pages. Yeah. And so we could go a long time on that one. I know. I know Moses. I remember Moses when he was in front of Sinai. He said to the people, he said, you don't need to be afraid. God's just trying to teach you how to fear him. Yeah, <laughs> He exactly. literally, literally says it. Mm-hmm. And then he says, okay, well, I, I, you need to don't come too close unless God gives you permission. We're going to set boundaries. But then God calls Moses to come near to him. So mm-hmm. it's as though Moses is not afraid to fear the Lord. And sure. he, that enables him to actually have a deeper intimacy with God. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's powerful well, stuff. Yeah. I, I think about if there's anything in your time, I want to ask you about this as we're closing up here, and I have something to appeal to people that are watching and, and just got some news for everybody in a little bit when we close. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about working as an evangelist in the church, encouraging people, building them up in their faith, so there's a layer of it where uh, I've heard pastors talk about tensions they've had with evangelists before and the big thing that they'll refer to is they'll be like what and i don't even put you on the spot i'm just talking about something technical in the church so pastors would be like well i have evangelists come in and they don't you know there's a tension with my people because you know the people get riled up but then they leave and i think that there are some pastors who clearly need to call the people to a higher standard and there are probably some evangelists who are are like uh too invested in working people up versus seeing a change. Sure, sure. So how do you, in, in your walk as an evangelist, what is the balance between that submission, the godly submission to authority, and then confronting people in churches that have legitimate sin and problems? That's a, that's a difficult one, and every situation is different. Mm-hmm. Um, I did have a church one time where I went in and I, I preached a message called Catching Sharks with Fishing Twine, yeah. and how that the church is we're trying we're trying to get a big harvest mm-hmm. and our our tools are small mm-hmm. and one of the reasons our tools are limited is because we have here's the sin in the church and i i went into mm-hmm. the message and listed things that now these are this is a very um i would call it a blanketing message yeah you can't find a church in america where these things don't exist mm-hmm. of course in scripture it says if you say you have no sin you make god a liar yeah. and so yeah. um when i'm what, but if i'm preaching a call to repentance i'm going to get i'm going to list things that people need to repent of mm-hmm. And I and I know this church because I've I've gone to this I've gone to it many times. I knew it was in there. <laughs> I knew, in fact, I knew yeah. all of these things were in there. And it really? was time. Yes. All, oh, yes. And I mean, you mm-hmm. could you could very clearly see it. You could hear it when you'd have conversations with people. Mm-hmm. And so I I preached and I and I called the Lord said you could, you can confront this, and it wasn't like a mean confrontation. But it was just you know this is sin. Yeah. This is sin. Yeah. We need to repent of this if we want to have a big harvest here. 
So I preached this message, I, and I gave my altar call. Now the altar's flooded, mm-hmm. okay? People, a bunch of people came up and repented for mm-hmm. things. During the altar call, I went to the back. It was the second or third day of the revival. It was a Sunday morning service. I wanted to hit the, the mm-hmm. Sunday regulars, I call them. I wanted to hit them with this word and just confront some things. And yeah. so while the altar call's moving, I go in the back to change so I can get ready for the night service, and I hear the pastor get up to close. He grabs the mic and he says, well, I'm, I'm grateful that we don't struggle with any of these oh, issues no. in this church. No. Well, what you've done is told the whole body they don't need to repent. Mm-hmm. It was a very sad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't been called back. Wow. <laughs> but but it's, it's, a, it's, a difficult, yeah. it's a difficult dynamic. Um, mm-hmm. to, it's a difficult thing to navigate. And you, honestly, it goes back to what we started this conversation with was, was obedience yeah the only the only way i can rest at night is if i can look at the lord and say i, obeyed you. I said yeah. everything you asked me to say mm. and if it riled the people up that's wonderful you know jesus's first sermon he they tried to throw him off a cliff and mm-hmm. he, he evaded as he often did invaded the people and yeah. so um it, you can't measure you can't measure success by was my offering big mm-hmm uh, where the altar's flooded, although that's a good that's a good fruit to have. Sometimes you're sometimes the message of the gospel is rejected, and so you mm-hmm. can't use you can't use carnal measuring sticks. Like, yeah. is my crowd big? Yeah. Is my offering big? Is the altar call full? And that's a hard thing for us because mm-hmm. in our American consumer culture, we we like to say results, su- success is yeah. numbers. It's money. Yeah. It's altars. It's partners signed up. Whatever, mm-hmm. what have you? Merchandise. Mm-hmm sold or, or whatever. But the, at the end of the day, if you can't lay your head down and say, I said everything Jesus asked me to say and did not mince a word, wow. then, then you can't have peace as an evangelist. Well, it's just like in the book of Acts, you know, when the apostles were first released after Pentecost to begin to preach the gospel. Mm-hmm. I remember when the, the heads of the Sanhedrin were trying to silence them, or at least mm-hmm. they, they said, don't speak the name of Jesus. You can heal people, but don't speak the name of right. Jesus. And then John and Peter uh, they they were talking to them. I think it was John and Peter. I know Peter was definitely the one speaking. Yes. And he said to these leaders, he said, well, I suppose it's more important to obey God rather than man. <laughs> it's like sarcasm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and, and that doesn't mean that you rebel against the head of the house. Mm-hmm. Like if you go into a church and, and speak, the pastor is the head of the house. Yeah. And so if I, if I walk, like... Uh, for example, I walked into church one time many years ago where the where the pastor said uh, we don't we don't believe in tongues don't don't preach on that's crazy don't preach wow. on that and I was I was prideful back then and mm-hmm. I was like uh, well I'll show you so I grabbed yeah. the mic and I got up there and I said everybody lift your hands and pray in your prayer language <laughs> whole building speaks in tongues I look over and the pastor's wife's like mm. very upset I thought I was doing a service to the Lord mm-hmm. because. It's very clearly scripturally appropriate, mm-hmm. very clearly, and we know that. But you can't go into someone else's house and move their furniture. Yeah, that's right. Unless they ask you to, mm-hmm. and they asked me not to. And there's a lot of other things I can preach mm-hmm. than that. But I was trying to thumb my nose at, at, mm-hmm. at that th- way of thinking, and that it is not my that is not my assignment. Mm-hmm. My assignment is to preach a gospel of power. And if you don't, um, if if you don't agree with that, then yeah. you can choose not to preach there. Mm-hmm. You can go to another house that will allow it. But if you go into someone else's house and move their furniture, and they told you not to do it, you're in. You're actually in rebellion, mm-hmm. even though you're doing things that are scripturally appropriate with mm-hmm. speaking in tongues. Mm-hmm. It's it's inappropriate with the guidelines of being in someone else's house. That means you're under their covering at yeah. that moment. The authority. Yeah, and so yeah. that's that's where the that's where the fine line can be difficult. Now with the with the church that the pastor got up and said, I'm grateful that we don't have any of this. He didn't tell me not to preach on that stuff. Yeah, the but Lord, then it, afterwards he came. Even when you were following an authority, he came yes. to cover up the message. And you, you've already done what God told you to do. Then you're released. Yes, yeah. and I, and I felt a release. I was yeah. upset that he did that. I was grieved mm-hmm. for the people, but I, I had peace in my spirit that I said what God yeah. asked me to say. Yeah. Um, but in a, like if like if you walk in a church and they say, well, you can't preach on the blood. Hmm. Whoa! <laughs> You're done. That's Whoa. there's nothing else. That's to a big say. deal, you know. Yeah. And so, um, if if you preach there, mm-hmm. and you preach on the blood, you're in rebellion. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't preach there. Wow! <laughs> you know, like if if someone yeah. told me not to do that, 
that would be the moment where I decide is 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 my offering and my booking tonight yeah. more important than the scripture? Yeah, you know, and so it's good central. It's like saying, "Don't preach the gospel here. Don't preach the right, power to set right. free from he's, sin." He's telling me not to preach on a cornerstone, and I've, yeah. I've heard he, I've, that's never happened to me. But I, I've heard evangelists say I was told not to preach on the blood <laughs> and not to preach on the cross because they're too gory. Mm. And so he said, "Well, you took all my messages. I guess I need to leave now." <laughs> yeah. And so he did leave. And and the pastor said, "Well, what am I going to do? There's hundreds of people out there." And he said, "I want you to go out there and tell them exactly what you told me right now." Wow. And so wow. that's the that's the. Yeah. I, I hope it didn't make that confusing there. But no, that's no. the line that you have to draw. Where you when you go into someone else's house, you have to abide by their house rules. And mm. if their house rules conflict with your convictions, then you can mm-hmm. leave. But you cannot go against their house rules, wow. or you're in you're in rebellion with God now. Mm. And so that I, that I believe is the difference. I think that's such a huge deal, um, mm-hmm. authority. And I did want to say to everyone on here as we're closing here. That first of all, thank you so much, Nick, for thank coming you. on as a guest. It's that was honor. a great that was a great note to end on because I felt like you had a really strong insight to give there. Thank now, you. No thank pun you. intended, uh, but <laughs> it's like the very <laughs> name see, of the show. I, I try to avoid doing that, but I uh, try to repeat the words of the name of the show. But I do want to say to you, if you're watching right now or you're listening over Spotify, Apple Podcasts. I do want to say that there's some of you out there that may be hearing this right now and feeling a burning in your heart. Mm -hmm. You're feeling a calling on your life and that God is calling you to go deeper with him. Uh, If you've never known the Lord and you're hearing this right now, I'd invite you to invite him into your life to confess him as Lord and Savior, to ask him to forgive you of your sins and to wash you clean. Go and get baptized, join a local church and follow the Lord. But if you're someone who is saved and you feel the calling of God on your life, I want to tell you right now, there is a way to get training. Do you feel ignorant about the things of God, about the Word of God? Do you feel like you're lacking direction about what you're supposed to do or training about what the Word of God says? And perhaps even in your local church, you don't really find anywhere to be trained. Well, you can go to iso.org, isow.org. And if you want to look at some of our free resources to see what we have to offer, you can do that at the very bottom, scroll to the bottom of our homepage. But by going there, you can find six different certificate categories. And what this does, even if you don't pursue a bachelor's degree, which you can on our website, you can make a commitment to God that Mm -hmm. you're taking him seriously, that you want to study his word, that you want to go deeper with him. And then by earning these certificates or by signing up on a monthly or all access pass subscription or even purchasing an individual course, you can begin to study the Word of God in a deeper way than you ever have before. Thank you so much. I highly recommend ISO. I've taken several courses. I haven't pursued the bachelor, but I've taken several courses and uh, leadership and mentoring, powerful stuff for uh, a minister of any category and of any age. So highly recommend ISO. This is great stuff. Great educational opportunity here for, for you. Thank you so much, and you guys have a great one, and we'll catch you next time around with ISO Insights. Thank you, everybody. 